Next Door Neighbors is made possible by the support of the Nissan Foundation. Nashville, Tennessee is the home of country music, a global destination for fans and musicians alike. Here live an untold number of singers, songwriters, and players, artists who've come to Music City with little more than a dream. And those dreams often originate in the most unlikely places. How does a person from Sao Paulo, Brazil, a kid, ends up in Nashville, Tennessee, the capital of country music, Music City, USA. I can't exactly explain what happened, but I know that I follow the dream and I work very hard and I continue to work hard. But sometimes hard work and determination aren't enough. Even within the so-called universal language of music, people have ideas about who fits the bill. I had never really thought that I was too different races or two different cultures. I was born and raised in America in the United States, but with very strong Mexican traditional cultural roots. And then when I came here and I really saw this resistance, it like hit me in the face and it took me by surprise. Despite a history of segregation and a music industry still dominated by white male voices, today's Nashville is drawing people from all over the world. The immigration situation that we have, like the different cultures coming in, is making all the different kind of music possible. And you're able to do things that you weren't able to do several years ago. There's music everywhere. Everybody's a musician here. <laughs> and now people start loving my music, and then I'm the happiest man. <laughs> I moved to Nashville in 1994, pretty much just like everyone else, wanting to write music, wanting to play country music. I'm in love with tradition, with the real deal. That's what I like. I don't like fake whatsoever. And therefore, obviously, if I'm a country music lover, it was going to end up being traditional country music. So I was coming to Lower Broadway pretty often. This one afternoon, I came downtown, and of course, for whatever reason, I was very attracted to this place. I walked in here and I asked if I could talk to Mr. Robert. He got up and he said to me, do you play country music? And I said, yes, sir. You know, can you sing country music? And I said, yes, sir, I reckon I can. But he said that I should get up on stage and, and play a couple of songs with this band. After that, he said, I was hired and he was going to put a band behind me and before I knew I was, I was the new band at Robert's Western World. It was then that I really realized how green I was. When they come to Nashville, I don't care how big you are back in your town, when you come here, man, it's a total different vibe. I'm up on that stage with those guys and I realize I didn't know anything. You just told me to those first steps onto the Nashville stage may have been intimidating, but that moment was the culmination of a lifelong journey. I grew up in Brazil, Sao Paulo, and as a child I did hear some country music. John Denver, Country Roads, Take Me Home, and all of that. To me, that was country music. Of course, in Brazil, I never got to listen to Hank Williams or Johnny Cash or anything like that, not growing up anyway. Those are names that I learned since I've come to America. For Jesse Lee, coming to America has been an ongoing education, one that began with a search for self-discovery. I grew up really not knowing who I was. Who am I? What am I doing here? What is, what is, what is my goal in life? What is my mission? I had, I had nothing. I had nothing. I was so so open for a direction, for some kind of guidance. When I came to America, I embraced the American way in every facet, if you understand what I'm saying. His first embrace, however, would come at a cost. He was robbed by the one person he spoke to after coming through immigration. So I lost everything. So he took everything that I had, including a guitar. Left with nothing more than bus fare, Jesse made it as far as Peoria, Illinois, where he had an acquaintance. There he was taken in by a local family with 10 kids. 
Before long, he was earning his keep by doing dishes, changing diapers, and delivering newspapers. It's also where he learned to speak English. So what I had to do was try to do the best that I could do. And I was so blessed with the fact that there were so many young kids and they were watching Sesame Street. And my God, I, that was such a blessing. Not only did they give him a home and help him learn English, the family even helped him buy a new guitar. And over the next 10 years, he'd hone his chops playing gigs in Illinois. I was singing and playing retirement homes, playing gigs, playing honky-tonks in Peoria bars and restaurants and things. In 1990, I became an American citizen, and that was a big thing in Peoria. For Jesse, it was time to see just how far his newfound voice would carry him. Nashville is the place to be. So it's pretty much like everybody else realizes if they want to fulfill the dream, whatever it may be, in the music industry, and it's country music, they end up finding themselves in, in Nashville. So I began visiting some of these thrift stores and getting myself old suits, you know, in the old Western ties. There was a transformation. I mean, it was like, it was like I was always meant to be there and I had finally found myself. But Jesse wasn't your average country boy and the guys in Robert's previous house band, BR549, were still trying to find a label for this unlikely troubadour. I think one of the guys of Beer 549 started saying, well, this guy's a Brazilian hillbilly, man. All right, let's everybody dance. Eventually, they settled on Brazil Billy, and the band name stuck. I just spoke a different language, coming from a different country. But I, I knew where they were coming from, and I felt that I was in my environment. Now, fast forward, and here I am. The proprietor, I hate the word owner, I say proprietor of Robert's Western World. And yet, I say this to you and I say this to anybody. I am Jesse Lee, the musician, the kid from Brazil. Today, that kid from Brazil has preserved one of Nashville's most iconic honky tonks. And while much of Lower Broadway now reflects a polished, commercialized version of country music, Robert's Western World lays claim to its authentic country roots. Robert's Western World is the absolute ultimate home of traditional country music in Nashville, Tennessee. Roberts is hillbilly Hollywood. And Jesse is not exactly flexible when it comes to honoring tradition. At Roberts, it's the law. So I've had people say to me, man, you like the, you know, the traditional country music cop. Oh, I am, I am. I'm extremely proud of that. There's no bending, no bending. It blows my mind that, that I could, in any way, shape, or form, help shape this, this idea of traditional country music in Music City and be called the ambassador of traditional country music. That's, that's like, it doesn't even fit in my head. But you know, we have a lot of power with what we do. Music influences people. The people that come here from, they come here from all over the world to listen to this music. night off or anybody asks me, where should I go to hear music? I'm like, you have to go to Robert's Western World downtown. It's traditional. All the players are phenomenal. Like so many others who are true fans of traditional country music, Rachel Rodriguez got her first taste of Nashville's live music scene at Robert's. I was there with my dad. We had come to record a country demo. We went in that bar and I was listening to, it was Don Kelly and the Brazil Billy came on right after. And sitting right there, having a beer with my dad saying, I'm moving to Nashville. I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I'm moving to Nashville. For Rachel, seeing Jesse Lee, another Latino, at home on the country music stage made an impression. I'm like, oh, well, he's doing it. So I thought, well, okay, then I shouldn't have a problem doing it either. Well, it was a little different for me. This is Mama singing with Abuelo when we lived in Michigan. Well, I grew up in Michigan singing a combination of country music, Tejano music, a little bit of mariachi music with my father in his band. He is 
Tejano, he's Tex-Mex, and he's also a child of a migrant worker. So I come from migrant working families who would go travel annually from South Texas up to Michigan or Wisconsin or Montana to work in the fields. And he was a musician and he brought that up with him. Although Rachel was born in the United States, hers is the story of Latin American diasporas, communities of people who no longer live in their countries of origin but still actively identify with their cultural and ethnic homelands. That identity may include things like food, dress, language, and of course, music. Tejano is Tex-Mex music. And so it stems from, or it comes from, like Norteño music out of North Mexico. So when families like my family traveled or came from North Mexico and came to Southern Texas, they brought that music with them. Although traditional Tejano music is dominated by the accordion, Rachel has learned the value of compromise, not to mention how fluid musical genres can actually be. And my father and his family moved to Michigan there weren't a whole lot of clubs that were playing Tejano music. So he decided, well, if, if you take the accordion out and you put in an electric guitar, well, we've, we've got kind of a country music vibe happening here. And so then that's kind of how we started doing country music. To me, there was no difference other than a different language. It was all heartfelt music and roots music. While Rachel saw only sunlight between the Latin genre and its American counterpart, she found that country music during the early 2000s remained a pretty exclusive club. Well, when I first arrived to Nashville, I was so excited. It was a dream come true to come to this place where country music was born and came from. As I started to slowly try to sit in and do different gigs, especially on Lower Broadway. I got met with some interesting comments that were, well, I don't quite get what you're doing because you look like Selena, but you're singing Tammy Wynette, but you sound like Aretha Franklin. I don't get it. And it never dawned on me that there were no women of color, or really anybody of color at that time, on mainstream country radio. And so I did not look like your typical country artist. And so, you know, people unfortunately listen with their eyes sometimes. So I really had to, you know, put myself together and figure out, okay, now what am I going to do? I love the music, but right now it's not loving me. Rachel hasn't stopped singing country music. Instead, she now incorporates it into sets that include rock, soul, and of course, Latin music. My dad always told me, remember who you are, remember where you came from, remember your music. But again, I carry that Latin tradition with me, and so everything is kind of infused with a little bit of flavor and that little Latino flair. Nailing down what defines Latin music isn't easy. But as the Latin scene in Nashville has grown, musicians like Giovanni Rodriguez are experimenting with an ever-changing formula of culture, geography, and style, born from the diversity of Latinos that have made Nashville home. Each country has their own sound, own instruments that have been exported. They all have their own rhythms, the own background, so I try to bring in as many different people as possible, whether they be from Cuba, Mexico, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Colombia, even other Americans. Try to bring them all together and everybody can play each other's music and learn each other's instruments and try to be what the United States is, a melting pot. Although Latin music has many regional forms and varieties, perhaps the best known example from that melting pot of sounds is salsa. What originally began as a Cuban form called son eventually made its way to New York City. So they started mixing the music, you know, across cultures. They started mixing the melodies and the chords from the jazz rhythms with the Latin American rhythms. The tempos vary, it's extremely danceable, and what I've noticed in salsa music is that there's never 
a group set of people that are there. It's, it's from all ages, all races, and everybody's, again, like the music, it's the sauce of everybody. Everybody's intermingling with everybody, everybody's dancing with everybody. While being highly melodic and lyrical, it's the rhythm that makes salsa a dance floor favorite. Here's one of the basic rhythms in salsa, which is called the tumbao. So it's a... Uh, One song that we'd like to do in a salsa style is an uh, arrangement of I Wish by Stevie. I believe dancing and melody and music get bring people together by hopefully just realizing you could have fun and just enjoying what you don't know. And for those who don't know the joy of salsa, there's opportunities to learn. Plaza Mariachi is a Latin-themed entertainment and shopping center located in the heart of Nashville's southeastern corridor. One. There, they host weekly salsa lessons, which are followed by an evening of dancing. The structure of salsa allows everyone to enjoy it. You don't have to speak Spanish. You don't have to have come from Latin America. You don't even have to understand the arrangements or the composition of the music. Vibrant, joyful, improvisational, within a structure, and so it allows access to everyone. While it might seem complex, and it is rhythmically and musically quite challenging, it's available to everyone, and you, all you have to do is be able to see or hear, and you're able to see the joy on the faces of people who do it. I think music is essential and such a, a vehicle to continue to keep the culture alive to the next generation. And not just for us, but to also educate others because music gets inside your body, it gets inside your soul and your entire being. So whether you understand what the heck anybody's saying or singing, it just feels good. And now it, it does, language is not even a barrier. Music has always been in my life. That's why I decided to be a nurse. Because in a nursing, you can work any shift. You make your own schedule. That leaves you plenty of time to do your music. It's a familiar story in Nashville, Tennessee. An aspiring musician comes to town hoping to make a mark in Music City. But that rarely happens overnight and the long game usually includes a reliable job. It's a lesson Peter One learned the hard way after first arriving in the U.S. in the mid-90s. When I first came, that's what I thought. I thought that music would be primary occupation. I had enough money to live at least for two years, but within one year, I was broke. <laughs> I was broke, so I decided to be a nurse. When I left the Ivory Coast, I knew, I knew already that it, was, it wasn't going to be easy. But I was determined because in my mind, if you don't try to reach a better place, you're going to die poor, you're going to die unsatisfied, you're going to die unhappy. I don't want to die like this. I want to die by trying to reach what I want. <laughs> Peter One's musical journey has been a long and winding road. Back in West Africa during the 1980s, he and his musical partner Jess Sabi had a hit record, Our Garden Needs Its Flowers. Eventually, they were performing to stadium-sized audiences throughout the region. Of course, the, the whole album made us, you know, somebody gave us his face, a voice, you know, some of recognition. While only a couple of songs were done in English, American listeners will hear familiar country and folk rock themes woven seamlessly together with African beats and styles of singing. It's a musical theme you can hear on songs like Apartheid, but as the name implies, within the music was a message. Poverty, you know, inequality, greed, you know, all that and I've always been sensitive to that. By using music, you can convey a lot of ideas. That's the only way we had. We have no money, we're not <laughs> powerful people, so we use what we have. While the apartheid system of racial segregation went on to be abolished in South Africa, 
the political and economic situation in Ivory Coast had begun to deteriorate, leaving Peter to question what kind of future he had in his home country. Music was doing good, but the environment wasn't good. <laughs> the country was starting to get into political turmoil. That's when Peter made his move to the U.S., a decision that would leave his music in a state of obscurity for years to come. You're nobody. People don't take time to listen to you. They don't take time to see who you are. They don't care. <laughs> but then an unexpected thing happened. His record was rediscovered in the U.S. after being re-released by the record label Awesome Tapes from Africa. Like a dream. Like a dream. Having this album known, you know, presented in the United States, it's like a dream. For Peter, it's led to some welcome opportunities, like being featured on public radio and getting invited to play festivals in the U.S. and Canada. Trying to take advantage of this, what is happening now, to present new things, to let the people know that there's more, there's more inside, more in the box. That was just one album, eight, only eight songs. But thanks to that one album, he's made some meaningful connections in Nashville. Thank God I've met musician friends, musicians here who loved what I did in the past and who decided to work with me on my new songs. And we're working, we're working in that, we have our little shows. I've thrown house shows at my house with people from all over the world because I love world music and I don't think there's enough exposure for people. I mean, my community are primarily white millennials and it's just an enriching experience for us to get to hear other people's stories and be reminded that our little circle is not the whole world, that other people have vast experiences. So, how are we doing, man? Good. Kevin Daly is a Nashville-based producer. His past experience includes recording music in places like Africa and Central America. When he first heard Peter's music, he felt a real connection. I was stunned. I couldn't believe that something that Laurel Canyon country sounding had come out of Africa in the 80s and was staggered by it and immediately just hunted him down on Facebook and reached out because I, I heard that he lived here. Today, the two of them have teamed up to produce something uniquely Nashville while remaining authentically West African. For Peter, it's an opportunity to sing about issues that affect him personally. Now, what I'm working on is an album of 10 songs, and those songs will be mostly, you know, the topic. It's gonna be the same thing, the quality. On the second part, do the same thing, but starting from the highest note. Exactly, yeah, something like that. Yeah. My next step is going to be on talking more, singing more about the issues, the life of African people in the United States. African migrants, there's a lot to tell about their the life here, our life. Out of my collaboration with Peter, for one, it's really exciting because I love his music and he's becoming a really dear friend to me. So I'm going to continue to make a space for anyone who has an interesting story, especially people that are as different from me as possible. One of Peter's newest songs, called Birds Go Die Out of Sight, is a cautionary tale, reflecting on whether one can ever truly return to a place and a life that are now decades in the past. Don't go home. Don't go home. There's nothing for you there. That song come from an experience. A friend of mine who decided to go home and he didn't make it. Don't go home. I'm saying that when you leave your home, go, home. go live in a new place for a long time, you have in some point considered that your home. That's your home because as time goes by, you become different from what you were in the past. You're not the same person. And the place you left is not the same either. You never know what's going to happen. Many 
live your life the best way you can where you are. Nashville is the right place for me. It's the right place for me. And I'm great, really grateful. Visit ndn.wnpt.org to see more stories in our Next Door Neighbors series. Thanks for watching. Next Door Neighbors is made possible by the support of the Nissan Foundation.